children, just a reminder, today is the last day to pick up, uh, to donate a stuffy, your Bible buddy, and to pick up and adopt the new one. So, and for children online, um, if you would like to participate still, you can reach out to me. And those who've reached out, I will connect with your moms this week. Um, you can find this online too. It's for a printout and it's your schedule for the Lent readings. We will go through the Mo Book of Mark. Okay, so good morning, Bridgeway. Um, I hope you had a great family day weekend last week. Pastor John is away, so I hope he is getting some much needed rest. To, um, so for the past month, we have been speaking on the book of Amos. How has that been for you? What have you learned? Has anything um, changed for you in your knowledge of God or in your relationship with God? Um, has anything stirred within you or disturbed you? Because for me, it has. Uh, to be honest, I have never preached from the book of Amos. I have been in children's ministry and taught in the church setting for many years and have never taught from Amos. And so this journey has been interesting, it has been challenging, and I had to wrestle with this book and figure out how do I preach this to children uh, on a weekly basis. And then today, as I stand here, I had to also wrestle with the truth that it kept speaking to me, and it was challenging me and examining my own heart and my motives. And so today, I have the honor to close this sermon series uh, with you and share the good news and the hope that is written in the last few verses of Amos. So people who are joining us for the first time today or may have missed the introduction to Amos, we have been going through this book for the past month. Um, Amos was not a prophet, he was not a son of a prophet, and he was not a son of a priest. He was actually a shepherd and he was a gardener. He took care of sycamore fig trees and it was in a place called Tekoa in Judah, which was the southern part of the kingdom. Uh, he was called by God and qualified by God to take a message to Israel, which was the northern part, and he was going to tell them and the neighboring nations about God's judgment and wrath towards them. It was during a time of peace as a nation and prosperity for really only the wealthy. Um, and with all the comforts, luxury, false hopes, and security, their hearts started to stray away from their God. Um, they started to worship idols and false idols and false gods, and they started to put their trust and hope in things that were created rather than their creator. God who is holy, perfect, and just. He didn't want to punish or judge his children, and so he kept sending them warnings and messages, telling them to repent, to turn back, turn away from your sins, come. Um, but they refused, and they didn't listen, and they didn't acknowledge their sins, and continued to live in rebellion with God. So Amos is sent to Israel to tell them to meet, get ready, get ready to meet your God. And they're thinking of this encounter that's going to be light, that's going to be great. And Amos goes and tell them, no, get ready to your meet, meet your God because your meeting is not going to be light. In fact, it's going to be darkness and it's going to be a day of judgment. God was going to judge them and um, punish them for their sins. So why was Israel being judged? Israel had a special relationship with God. And that also came with responsibility and accountability. Israel believed God showed them favoritism towards them and that they were somehow exempt from God's divine judgment. They were quick to condemn the sins of the neighboring nations, um, but were blind to recognize their own arrogance, pride, and sin. Um, and they thought their sins would go unnoticed and not be judged by a God who, in essence, is holy and righteous. They, the wealthy ignored the needs of the poor and also aggravated their living situations. They sold them into slavery for their debts and denied them justice by lying and cheating. They, um, with, with all the false sense of hope and security that they were building around themselves, they, um, their hearts were divided and they start, their worship was um, meaningless and self-centered. 
God detested their empty worship, arrogance, and hypocrisy. They became spiritually complacent. So, can any of you guys relate to any of these? <laughs> I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I can. I am guilty of many of these things. And I'm guilty of putting many times my trust and my hope in things I can see and touch. When you think about it, they really don't have any power to sustain you, to save you, to protect you. And I can get so busy with my life that the needs and the injustices around me can go unnoticed. I can get arrogant and proud and probably not even realize that I'm arrogant and proud and probably not very fun to be around. Um, and the scariest of all, far from God. God opposes the proud and raises the humble. So when we abide in God, uh, we are humbled, naturally humbled, by his greatness, his love, and faithfulness. When we are close to God, we know where we stand before him. And that's the true meaning of humility. I really wish I could stand here today and tell you that my love for God causes me to show no favoritism to anyone, to have an urgency and seriousness to the, for the lost all around me, and not just the people under my care, to keep my walk with him so close um, in check and discipline that I don't get to set complacent to not fear the things of this world, but to actually fear being led astray from him and his truth. Um, to walk and live in reverence of my God every day, all the time. To courageously and boldly stand up for social injustices, to have the heart to help those in need, and not just something to do once in a while, but something to do every day of my life. So I'm feeling quite exposed here right now, <laughs> but as I was praying for this sermon, I'm telling you, it was hard. It was very hard. Um, and as I was praying for this sermon and for all of you who are listening, um, I had to really bring my true self before the Lord, and I had to acknowledge that I need Jesus, and the, he is the only one that is going to qualify me to stand here to speak to you on a weekly basis and today. Um, uh, yes, I have the heart for the loss, the desire to be disciplined, and constantly check my heart's devotion to God, to be fearless in the face of injustice. But there's only so much we can do in our own strength, effort, and knowledge. Yes, we must love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And as we do our part in loving Him and maintaining a proper right relation with him, God will do his part in what he can only do and supply his grace, which is sufficient for us. God's amazed, everything God does, it starts with grace, it starts with his love and ends in restoration through his son, Jesus. So today I'm telling you, God is in the business of restoration. God's amazing grace and mercy invites us back to him in repentance and freely gives us the gift of forgiveness, salvation, and righteousness through his son, Jesus. If we don't understand this foundational truth of who God is, we won't understand what he does, and we won't understand why Israel had to go through what they did. God is holy. He, can, he cannot tolerate sin. He must confront evil and sin. The Bible states that the penalty for sin is death. Sin must be accounted for. Israel's sin had to be judged, and their rebellion eventually led them into exile. Even in the midst of judgment to, to Israel, God, you can see glimpses of God giving them chances to return to him and to repent by saying, seek me and live. And if you think about the opposite of that, what is that? Because if they don't seek him and live, then there's destruction and wrath and judgment on the other side. God gave people a chance to always turn away from the sins and to return to him in repentance, but they refused. They refused to change. They continued to live in rebellion. As I mentioned before, God is holy, righteous, and he's a promise keeper. So today in the last few verses of Amos, we see promises, and we know that God is a promise keeper. He will not make promises and then change them depending on the people. So in this case, Israel. 
He is faithful and true. So we can trust that all his promises will come to pass and they will be fulfilled. We must understand God, he chose Israel before they chose him. God chose to have a covenant with Israel um, out of his love and not something that they did for him. Um, God is in the business of restoration, healing, and salvation. The whole book of Amos is pretty much, like, pretty much a pronouncement of judgment and wrath. Like, if you've read it, it's, there's nine chapters, and it's all judgment and wrath. <laughs> Um, and the last, five ver- uh, the last few verses of um, chapter 9, we see it's, it's different. And in chapter 9, we learn God's judgment is unavoidable. There is no escape. So there is no one who can actually escape the judgment of God. And it says that you can go to the highest mountain and he will find you. You can go to the floor of the deepest sea and he will find you. So no one can escape his judgment. Um, some thought that uh, some thought that they were an exception, and the day of the Lord would not come for them. Many even believe today that there is no such a thing as the day of the Lord. When the Lord would come, and He will judge, He will fulfill all His promises, and and some believe that. Um, today, in the last five verses of the Bible. Uh, the book of Amos, it drastically changes in tone. So we hear now there's promises and there's hope. God was going to restore Israel. He was going to restore them as a nation, restore their land, restore their faith, their relationship with him, and restore David's kingdom. So if we look in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God makes a promise to David. He promises that his house and his kingdom and his throne will rule forever, will reign forever, for endure forever, establish forever. Someone from David's house, someone from David's line was going to succeed David, and that kingdom and throne was going to be established forever. Now, just like grain is shaken in a seed, I don't have those big ones to show you, but I really wanted to, but this is the closest I found in my house. And so just like a grain is shaken in a sieve, God says in verse 9 that he will shake the house of Israel among all the nations. There will be a sifting process where he will separate the sinners and the faithful. So the function of this sieve is that it, will, it is going to trap the things unwanted, the elements, the particles that are unwanted so that it could be thrown away. And the grain will fall through the sieve and the unwanted materials would be trapped and sifted. God's judgment was pronounced to the whole nation of Israel as a, as a whole. But God also saw and brought hope to the remnant of people who were faithful. There is a promise of abundance for Israel in these verses. This is a contrast to the drought and the famines pronounced before. In verse 13, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman, and the planter will be one treading by the one treading grapes. Now new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. The land will produce so much that there won't be a break between the people who are reaping and the people who are planting again. The mountains will drip with sweet wine because of the abundance of ripened grapes. So he's showing this picture, a promise of abundance. In verse 14, the Lord promises to reverse the fortunes of his people, Israel. God will restore and bring his people, Israel, back into their land, rebuild the ruined cities, enable them to live in them, and enjoy the fruit of them, the land. He promises to not uproot them from the land again. God is in the business of restoration. God's promise to David and to Israel is fulfilled through Jesus Christ, who is from the line of David. And he is through Jesus Christ, his kingdom and his throne will be established forever. Jesus Christ is the promised hope. Jesus brings restoration, healing, salvation, and righteousness. Apart from Jesus, you have judgment and wrath. One day we are all going to stand before God and we are going to have to give an account of our life. We can either stand there in our own righteousness and receive judgment or we can stand before him with Christ's um, righteousness. Jesus is our good news and Jesus is our savior. And I mean this in the most literal sense. Jesus is a demonstration and evidence of God's love 
and mercy. God's judgment is unavoidable and unescapable. So how great is the love of our Father. He would provide a way for us, for all who put their trust and faith and hope in Jesus, that our penalty, that our judgment of sin is accounted for. So as I was preparing for this sermon, I thought of my red plant. I got this as a gift in December for moving into my new home. And I was very excited to keep it alive. I'm a little embarrassed to show this, especially in front of Daryl, but I got some hints and tips. Um, yes, and I was very determined to keep this alive. So I, I got this, and I'm not very good with plants, just to tell you. And this was the only plant that I have in my house. This is the only plant I have in my house at the moment, and it looks like this. Um, so I put it in front of the window, a small window, on a very nice round table, and then I thought, I'm going to water it. So I watered it every day. And then I realized the leaves were falling, and I was getting, like, you know, brown, and my dog kept eating all the leaves on the ground. And so I thought, maybe I'm watering it too much. And so I stopped watering it every day. And then it was still dying and falling, and so then I thought, maybe it's not getting enough sunlight. So I changed the location and put it in front of a bigger window, and this is what it looks like today. And so the reason that I brought my plant today is to demonstrate that a process of restoration, um, there's a process to that. And I know with plants, I don't know very much, Google told me, but for a plant to be restored, you have factors like the sun, the water, there's sometimes bugs, and nutrition. And so Daryl was telling me some hints too, and that's a lot of work. But for this plant to be restored, there is a process. And I wanted to say that Israel also needed to go through a process of restoration as well to renew their covenant and relationship with God. So, Bridgeway, seek him and live, hate evil and love good. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I pray our Bridgeway brothers and sisters will put our hope and trust in Jesus and him alone. The world around us, as we see it, can instill fear, uncertainty, despair, anxiety, fear. Um, but God promised a new, renewed kingdom through Jesus Christ. On the day of the Lord, there will be judgment and wrath. But for those who put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus, there will be also salvation and hope. Um, we can live in this world right now. Uh, with a sure hope in Jesus and a hope anchored in Jesus. God's promises never fail, and nothing in this world can stop his promises from being fulfilled, not even our failures and not even our disobedience. His promises will be fulfilled. So in Romans 8, 35, 39, I just wanted to share with you all, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask today, where are we putting our hope and trust? Have we raised things in our lives apart from Jesus that give us a false sense of um, security and hope? And those things can be uh, financial security, maybe a spouse, a partner, our family, our jobs, our education, a political party, are we loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength that it extends out to the people around us and to our society? Who or what are we worshiping? Who is at the center of our worship? And this might sound like a weird question and an obvious question for some, but it can be quite scary that we might be at the center of our worship. It can be deceptive how one can grow up in the church, can serve in the church, and know so much of God, but never personally meet his son, Jesus Christ. Um, 
So as I was studying the book of Amos, I was reminded of a quote I saw from Tony Evans. Um, and it goes like this. If you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave the place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up church bulletin. I pray that our attitude of worship would be like a lifestyle rather than something we limit once a week. I also pray that what we choose to magnify in worship would be our God and our living God in him alone. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to come together in one voice, in one heart, and at the center of our worship, we pray, and we want to magnify you and magnify you alone. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for Jesus, your son, and you have demonstrated and showed us in no other, like, it's just the most um, evident way of your love through him, and that all your promises are being fulfilled through your son. Father, we thank you so much for this community of faith. We thank you for this church that we can come and we can worship you. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would examine us and it would uh, reveal to us who is at the center of our worship. And we pray that it would be you alone. Father, in our homes today and in, in this place, we ask that you would be present and that we would have eyes to see you and ears to hear your truth. Father, we pray um, that you would just continue to be with uh, Bridgeway family as we um, don't leave this place in this time of worship, um, that we would carry on this attitude of worship as a lifestyle and that you would be at the center of all we do. Lord, that loving you is also means to love others and have mercy for others, that it would be translated in everything that we do and say. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.